I want to thank everyone for coming out on this Wednesday morning. I know there's many things you could be doing. Uh, and I count myself privileged and blessed uh, to see so many beautiful faces, uh, so many wonderful Norfolk, and so many other uh, stakeholders uh, in the future of this city who have taken time out of this schedule to come and hear what we have to say uh, this morning. I want to acknowledge Jose Cordero, who's the chair of our Public Safety Committee. Uh, Jose uh, is one of the great uh, law enforcement uh, officials, intellectuals, and thinkers in the United States. It was my pleasure to work with him uh, for a couple of years uh, during my time, our time together in New Jersey Attorney General's office. Uh, he produced historic games uh, in crime production in the city of Stone. He did the same for us at the state level. Uh, he chaired our safety effort and <coughs> the ideas that we have on the of his community and his experience. I'm very honored to be with him uh, as well. Uh, if I couldn't go any further, I'll take around with Pastor Allen and Phil Long, uh, Missionary Baptist Church, and Miss Bess as well, for those beautiful, beautiful remarks uh, we opened up uh, this morning with. I also want to acknowledge the other members of our Public Safety Committee, uh, which again is complete with some of the best thinkers and practitioners uh, on safety matters in the state of New Jersey and indeed in the United States. Uh, former Attorney General Ann Milgram uh, gave us a lot of time and effort. Uh, uh, Cordero, Mr. Cordero, I talked about Valeria Lawson, uh, the former Executive Director of the Juvenile Justice Commission for the State of New Jersey. Uh, Joseph Shields, uh, the former Executive Director of the New Jersey Parole Board, uh, as well as Giles Schiff, former Police Director of Plainfield, and the former President of the National Organization for Black Law Enforcement Executives. We stand here today uh, in the great and beautiful South Korea. Uh, I grew up right around the corner from here on Harding Terrace and live around uh, the corner as well on Chancellor Avenue. Uh, the Southport is home to some of the city's greatest and most historic neighborhoods. The people of the South are beautiful, smart, and proud. Yet over the last four years, the safety of the South, like too much of the city, has deteriorated dramatically. The streets of the South are a war zone. Open-air drug markets populate the war. Uh, the war suffers more murders than any other war in this city. Uh, to date, just in 2013 alone, there have been 35 murders in the South War. Uh, uh, up from 25 a few years ago. A 40% increase since new leaders have been elected in this war. We're on pace to have over 42 murders uh, in the South War just this year, uh, making the South War one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the state of New Jersey. Recently, during a crime wave in which 10 people were killed in North in 10 days, most of them here in the South, a South War resident described the state of affairs in the war and in the city in very powerful terms. He said, another sad day in North this used to be a quiet community. I personally understand the toll emotionally and psychologically of gun violence. My mother would be murdered when I was a young child. And I know what it means not simply for individuals and families, but what it means for communities and neighborhoods to go through the trauma and the toll of you losing a loved one to through violence. So we face difficult times when it comes to our safety in the city of Newark. In fact, three more Newarkers were just killed yesterday. But there is hope. Cities facing challenges similar, similar to ours have dramatically improved public safety. The plan that we announced today is rooted in what has worked in places similar to North. It is also reflected my own track record as an assistant attorney general uh, who worked with Joe and others, helped to reduce violent crime throughout the state of New Jersey three years in a row, doubled the graduation rate for kids in the juvenile prisons in the state of New Jersey, reduced recidivism by 26% to our ex offender reentry programs. And we're found by the Andy Casey Foundation to be the best state in the country for alternative detention uh, for young people during our leadership. I am the only candidate for mayor, not only with a background in law enforcement, but also with an actual track record of proven results when it comes to this issue. We will not see different results if the city's next mayor is unproven or inexperienced in dealing with matters related to our safety. The people of North do not need to hear more speeches or more talk or more rallies. They need action and they need results, and we offer both. The Jeffrey's plan for safe streets and neighborhoods is about transformation, collaboration, transparency, and optimism. Our plan first seeks transformational change. The path to transformational change in North Public Safety begins with broadening our horizon and redefining our crime problem. Our focus is on public safety, which includes crime, disorder, and the fear of crime, not just crime itself. We can only fix these problems if we understand them. We will also broaden how we hold ourselves accountable by not only measuring data about crime, but about the perception of safety. We will use surveys and other instruments to ask our residents and our stakeholders about their perceptions about the safety in their neighborhoods. Incremental change is not enough. 
transformational change required to move from mediocrity to excellence in safety. Collaboration. Uh, neither the city nor government in general will solve our public safety problems alone. We will meet our challenges in partnership with county, state, and federal government, as well as with our city's greatest resources, its people, and our community, and our faith-based institutions. Our city is always greater together when we're all in and all invested in our future. Transparency. We will be upfront and we will be honest. We won't shower our residents with fuzzy stats. People can see through the smoke and can see through the mirrors. It makes them even more distrustful and resentful of government. We will eagerly share our successes with you, but we will also let you know what we're not doing so well and what we intend to do about it. We will never rely on statistics alone to determine how safe you are. We will rely on what you tell us. Our guide to what we can do to improve safety and security in your neighborhood uh, uh, will be determined by you, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. In addition to just walking into a police precinct, our aggressive use of technology will enable our residents and our stakeholders to tell us how they feel about safety in their city and the job that we are doing. Optimism. We are optimistic because the public safety overhaul that we propose is rooted in facts and backed by solid evidence of what has worked to significantly lower crime levels in cities similar to Newark. We know that the gains we see here in Newark have been done already. Right? This isn't something new and unimaginable. Other places have done it. In fact, we have done it. So we can know we can do it here. Cities like East Orange and New York, among others, have achieved historic levels of success in reducing murders, violence, and fear of crime. For example, New York has experienced 78% fewer murders in the last 20 years. East Orange has seen a 67% drop in murders since 2003. And overall crime declined there by 77%. That's just a few miles away. So there's hope because we know from experience that we can do better. A cutting edge vision executed by an experienced administrator will produce these sort of results. The result of the South Shore, for example, over the last four years revealed the shortcomings of talk over results. With these principles in mind, our plan recognizes that crime has many causes and that the most moral and most sustainable way to reduce crime is the best in hope and opportunity for North's people. So our plan contains three components prevention, enforcement, and reentry each essential to our integrated, evidence-based approach to safer streets and neighborhoods. Our full plan, which is available today and will be provided on our website, has 22 major policy initiatives spanning prevention, enforcement, and reentry. This morning, I will highlight a handful of some of the most powerful uh, parts of our agenda, but I please ask you to read the full plan. First, on the prevention side, we will seek to aggressively reform the way in which the pretrial system engages nor is charged with crime so that we make much smarter and much more cost-effective decisions about how to deal with individuals charged with crime. The focus is fundamentally different than the cookie-cutter approaches of others. Research consistently shows that the criminal justice system over-arrests, over-charges, over-prosecutes, and over-prosecutes people of color and urban people of color in particular. Research shows, for example, that about 50% of offenders are low risk and generally will not offend. About 40% pose a moderate risk of reoffending, and the remaining 10% are high risk and generally will reoffend. This means our system should be smart about treating people based upon the risk they propose, or our system does the opposite, imposing across the board ineffective punishments on offenders haphazardly. This is made worse through punitive and arbitrary bail laws, which result in thousands of offenders imprisoned on low-level offenses simply simply before because they cannot afford bail. According to one recent study, 40% of those in jail are eligible for bail, but simply can't afford it, many of whom are low-level, poor, non-violent drug offenders, for whom the, the government pays $30,000 per bed to house. This makes absolutely no sense, ignores the needs of low-level offenders, and drains resources that will be better used for more effective interventions. The city under my administration will become a national leader in pretrial reform. We will develop risk assessment tools based on proven models that accurately identify the nature of the safety risk posed by an individual. We will develop diversion programs that redirect nonviolent drug and prostitution offenders to treatment and services instead of arrest, prosecution, and imprisonment. These programs will provide a range of emotional, mental health, vocational, substance abuse, and other supportive services are a dramatically more cost-effective way of responding to low-level offenders, 
than processing through criminal courts and through jail. They also uphold our commitment to invest first in hope and in opportunity and to resort to arrest and punishment only as a last resort. We will consider models like the LEAD program in Seattle in crafting a program tailored to the specific needs of the North community. Second, we will support pre-arrest drug and mental health treatment programs. Our jails and prisons are flooded with nonviolent drug users or those suffering from mental illness, whose challenges will be much more effectively and sustainably addressed through treatment rather than incarceration. Uh, the Affordable Care Act provides resources and funding to provide nonviolent addicts and others suffering from mental illness with supportive services, and the city will use its resources to connect these individuals with the programs that they need to turn their lives around. Third, we will pursue early interventions for youth control. We will lead a multi-agency, public-private collaborative effort to provide interventions that will transform the lives of at-risk young people, uh, particularly those arrested or who otherwise show themselves at significant risk of falling astray. Programs like Youth Bill and Massachusetts Broker Program would provide intensive interventions that address the varied emotional, psychological, educational, and substance abuse challenges of our young people, have a proven track record of success, and represent the kind of intensive interventions we will pursue. These interventions will also include cognitive behavioral programs and other evidence-based programs with a track record of success. We will pursue not only child mentoring opportunities for our young people, but we will also use family mentoring programs that have been shown to be successful throughout the country and in places like Baltimore, because we know our kids do not grow up in isolation. They're part of broader families and broader communities. And for our children to have healthy, productive lives, they need to be brought up, nurtured in healthy and productive families and communities. On enforcement, we will empower our police department, particularly our frontline officers who put their lives on the line every day for the people of North with the competitive edge they need to be successful. This will include fostering public-private partnerships to provide our officers with the latest tools, equipment, and technology to do their job effectively. We will depoliticize the police department for the city of North. In the city of North, too many posts and assignments are based not upon the quality of service, but based upon who you know, whose fundraiser you attended to, who's taking you off. That includes costs for the people of North that raises your taxes, and it also means you're in much more dangerous neighborhood than you need to leave in. If you keep electing the same politicians, you're going to get the same old thing we've seen here. <coughs> so we will work aggressively to depoliticize our police department and provide our local commanders with the autonomy and the authority they need to succeed while rewarding creativity and community responsiveness. We will also implement comprehensive strategies to deal with violence, gangs, and drugs. Under my administration, the effectiveness of our police department <clears throat> will be measured by the crimes we prevent, not the arrests or, or uh, the arrests we make, or the drugs we seize, or the guns we seize. We will hold ourselves accountable by tracking the disposition of those arrests we make. Oftentimes, police departments arrest people, then they get off on mail for 72, 96 hours, or may be charged by a prosecutor for offenses different than what they arrested for. That means you don't have good police. So we're going to hold ourselves accountable and see what happens after we arrest them. Are they prosecuted? Uh, are, they, are they diverted to the programs that are designed to actually in effect uh, the, the, the needs that they present? Although we cannot control how prosecutors charge and pursue cases, we will track and, when appropriate, uh, impose appropriate corrective action if the arrests we make are routinely downgraded uh, to less serious offenses. In addition, we will strategically target our resources toward those individuals most responsible for crime. We will purposefully focus on intelligence gathering investigative policing, and the smart use of technology to identify and arrest those most responsible for the violence in our community. To facilitate this work, we will launch, we will launch a best-in-class, real-time, crime prevention data and intelligence center. The primary mission of the Technology and Intelligence Center will be to anticipate criminal activity and prevent North residents from becoming victims of crime in the first place. This approach is a significant departure from traditional law enforcement approaches that foster reactive, after the fact responses and investigations. This technology and intelligence center will track in real time criminal trends, help forecast future criminal activity so it can be prevented, and help the police use their resources more effectively than ever before. Third, we will create a violent crime task force, modeled after similar units that have been successful in other cities like Louisville and Baltimore, which will target violent crime. This unit will use cutting-edge technology 
leveraging local and federal databases and other resources to enable our officers to in real time track and use crime data along with good community-based police work to gather intelligence about those involved in criminal activity in our neighborhoods. Using that intelligence, the special unit, which will comprise some of the department's best officers, will aggressively target those most responsible for violence in our city. And finally, we will launch a multi-agency collaborative effort targeting gangs organized around guns, drugs, and violence. Gang activity is driving violence in our community, and we must have a targeted enforcement response. We will collaborate with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the United States Attorney's Office, the County Sheriff's Department, the County Prosecutor's Office, and the North Police Department, along with other municipal agencies. A central part of this strategy will be closing the open-air drug markets uh, that operate uh, uninterrupted throughout our city. Finally, the reentry component of our plan builds upon the work in North and throughout New Jersey over the last several years, including work that we did in the Attorney General's office, uh, comprising the Another Chance Project, as well as the Reentry Roundtable convened by the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Among the highlights of our reentry plan include bold probationary reform. Our resources are drained through expensive and counterproductive incarceration, as I've said before, of nonviolent drug offenders, and our streets are more dangerous as a result. The city will work with courts, as well as, as well as with our county and state partners, to launch an aggressive pilot probationary program, modeled after programs like the Hope Project, uh, which is being piloted throughout the country, that will seek to more effectively address, both through treatment and, when appropriate, probation rec revocation, the needs of nonviolent drug users. Second, perhaps no factor is as important to the successful reintegration of an ex-offender as a good job. The city of Newark will ensure a broad range of evidence-based training and certificate opportunities available for Norfolk's who are ex-offenders. The city first will work with our state and county cross partners to improve pre-release, academic, and vocational training opportunities with a particular focus of improving access to high-quality online training opportunities. In addition, the city will revamp our one-stop job and career training center and ensure it is a best-in-class facility for connecting Norfolk in general and ex-offenders in particular with job and career opportunities. Third, the city of Norfolk experienced substantial success uh, when we had our one-stop reentry centers, which were funded primarily by the Nicholson Foundation. My administration will seek to reestablish these one-stop centers in partnership with the philanthropic community. These centers provided one place for ex-offenders to access the range of supports, legal, social, housing, career, and family reunification, among others, required for successful reentry, and also mitigated against the effects of poor social service coordination and bureaucracy, where ex-offenders provide a miracle round in seeking to access the services uh, that they need. And finally, we will also have a specific focus on juvenile reentry. Much of the crime in our neighborhood right now is being committed by juveniles. And so we will work with our partners in the county and state level to improve online opportunities for our young people so that they can stay on track educationally and that they have a seamless transition back to the community. Online programs not only enable that seamless transition, transition they also uh, facilitate individualized instruction for our young people so that they can have instruction tailored to their particular needs. We will also seek additional measures focused on juveniles uh, uh, in terms of effective transition back to our school system, intentional focus on effective case management and family involvement, and specific coordination with the Juvenile Justice Commission and the Local Youth Services Commission to ensure successful and bureaucracy-proof transitions for juvenile offenders. So this is an overview and a highlight of our plan. We have our full plan available for you today. Uh, this is based upon best practices in the state of New Jersey and the city of Newark and throughout the United States of things that have worked. And what is very important for us to understand that we can do better. Other places do dramatically better than we do. This isn't some sort of fantasy in terms of uh, us uh, moving our city forward in Brighton and Broadway. We don't have to have 35 workers uh, in the South. We don't have to average our car jacket every day. We don't have to read article after article as we did waking up this morning with three board workers murdered, of women being stabbed, seniors being attacked, coming home from school, children being shot and killed on the way home from school. We don't have to live like this. But we will continue to live like this if we don't have leaders who know what they're doing. We've done this already. Everything we're talking about right now, we've done already. We have experience. <laughs> speeches, speeches and rallies are a nice thing. They're a beautiful thing. 
But when the speech is finished, when the rally is up, more people are being shot, more people are being carjacked, more people are being victimized. Obviously, it's not effective. And we've seen that right here in the South Florida. Over the last four years, murders are up 40%. 40%. We're on track to have over 42 murders in the South Florida alone. And that, would, and that would be exactly what we will see citywide. And we don't have leaders who know what they're doing. So I thank you so much for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Joe Cordero. Again, he's one of the nation's leaders and chair of our safety committee for some remarks from him. And after we hear from Mr. Cordero, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, and I'm going to be brief, but I, I want to tell you this. I have seen, I have witnessed the results of transformational change. I've had the privilege of working in the New York City Police Department as a police commander in the South Bronx and Washington Heights, places like New York, that experienced extraordinary um, levels of violent crime and murders, 2,000 murders when I was a captain. Um, I've worked in East Orange and I've seen a transformation. Um, today, East Orange is seeing an 80% as of last year overall crime decline. Six murders last year, including the, unfortunately domestic violence murders in LA. Six murders. If Newark had the crime rate of New York City and East Orange, they would experience about 15 murders a year, maybe 20 tops. Instead, we're talking about really, really high risks for the workers. Um, we're talking about children, we're talking about women, we're talking about men, we're talking about families. I've seen the results of transformational change. I know what it takes to, to, to implement transformational change. So when I see a plan, I know whether it can work or not. And I've seen Shabar's plan. It touches on the most important aspects of crime prevention. It says, you know, we've got to deal with what's happening on the street today. We can't ask families to wait five years from now when our other programs kick <laughs> in so that their children will be safe. No, we've got to take care of this generation of children to prevent the next generation from falling victims of crime and becoming involved in crime. That's what Shabar's plan does. It also does so smartly. And let me tell you what I, what I mean by smartly. You know, he went through a, a, a series of options and says, well, we know that's not proven. Well, that's, that may not apply to Newark. It works well somewhere else, but my experience in Newark tells me it's different. So he was a guide and a leader. And plans, I've seen many plans. I've worked with colleagues who had great plans. And some were more successful than others. Let me tell you why. It came down to leadership. It came down to vision. It came down to accountability. When I was held accountable, when I had leadership, when I had a mandate, unwavering mandate from my leader, I did my job. I knew the focus. The goal wasn't a moving uh, target. It was there. It was fixed. When I went with Shabar in the Attorney General's office, let me tell you what I, what I observed. I saw Shabar at the policy level, at the vision level, talking about a crime plan for New Jersey that was supposed to reduce the murder rate. Prior to that, the murder rate in New Jersey was a seesaw. One year down, one year up. And we did this over and over and over again. Our job was to set New Jersey on a path where there would be fewer murders every year. So Shabar, from a policy perspective, uh, went into action, talked about the crime plan, about the important things, many of them reflected in his plan for the city of Newark. And then I saw something I hadn't seen in a long time. He stood down from that policy position, rolled up his sleeves, sat down at the table, and did the work in the trenches. That's a leader. That's a transformational leader. I think that's a leader you need to help make Newark a lot safer than it is today. Yeah, so what we would do in this model model, I think that is a set of other places, uh, is really a forecasting center. 
uh, is really rooted in the kind of police work we do, so we're getting good information and good intelligence from our community, uh, which also raises the issue that you have to have effective community policing. Uh, right now, we've had the, the federal government investigate uh, the North Police Department because of misconduct. If there's not that trust between police and community, we're not going to get the information and intelligence we need so that we can feed it into our data and intelligence center so that the officers can have access to it. And we envision ultimately a system that's network so that offers anywhere, officers anywhere in the city can access that information and intelligence in real time so that they can use it in doing their police work. So it's, it's generating uh, um, more feedback in terms of where the problems are, where you know, who's good and what. Well, that's right, but it's also, I should add too, it's based upon uh, uh, predictive analytical work so that officers and effective users of the data can actually forecast where crimes are likely to, to happen. Most crime is committed by a relatively small number of people who tend to do things repeatedly or to have agents of theirs do crime repeatedly. And what we want to do is be very smart. So I've got a big emphasis of our crime plan is being very targeted uh, and, and purposeful with the use of our resources. Right, so, so to go around and arrest a lot of nonviolent offenders and take pictures and say, look, all these people are arrested uh, who are addicts and need treatment makes no sense. So we want to target those individuals who are causing most of the problems in our community. And the only way we can do that is through good data and good intelligence that offers have, officers have access to. And also, if we have that data and intelligence, we can have smart people who analyze that data and predict what's likely to happen uh, going forward, and then we can direct our resources in that way to reduce violent crime. These are some of the things that uh, Joe Cordero did in the stars that have led to those historic uh, reduction of crime over the city. Did you plan on the hiring back Well, we actually need more resources, and it's very important that people don't understand how we got this whole. Uh, the city council has raised their taxes 40%. They then laid off 170 cops. They gutted neighborhood services. Officers do not have the technology they need. Very old equipment, very antiquated equipment. Uh, and while the council did that, they didn't mind giving themselves a pay raise in 2011, 5%. They didn't mind driving around in cars that the taxpayers paid for. Uh, they don't mind having their family members on the payroll. Many of them don't mind having two or three public jobs while the average person struggles to get one. But then our frontline officers don't have basic equipment that they need. Programs for children are cut. Because we also talked about obviously prevention and reentry. So many of the programs for our young people have been cut. Our young people have after school programs they can otherwise have. Library hours have been cut. Museum hours have been cut. But our politicians enrich themselves. And so we're going to make different budgetary decisions. Right. Our, we're going to invest every dollar we can in the future of the city of North first. So that means not only the enforcement programs we talked about, the data intelligence center, the violence prevention task force we talked about, but also these prevention programs, failing them to mentor it. Uh, for our young people, for our families. Uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and other proven youth build type programs and other programs that have been proven to turn around the minds of our young people. Because first and foremost, we know the best way, the most moral, the most sustainable way to reduce crime is the best and open opportunity for our young people. Uh, that's why I spent most of my career fighting for educational transformation. Because I know what educational change did for me, and I want every young person in this city to have that same sort of opportunity. But again, this is another error. We're not going to see anything different. Keep sitting and saying, we're going to make the same decision they've been making decade after decade after decade. Shabar, good to see you. The uh, gang situation uh, we always see, the high incarceration rate is always the uh, distribution of controlled dangerous substance, not murder or whatever. What do you intend to do about those who are the suppliers? Because I heard you connect the dots with the DEA, the county, FBI, etc. Because we never hear too much said about the suppliers that we need to cut them off, and once we cut them off, we can do and deal with those other factors. Right. You know that that is a part of the uh, most agency task force that I talked about. Uh, because you know, Ibrahim, you're exactly right. That's going to require a collaborative effort, which is why collaboration is a big part of our plan. So we have to work with the FBI. We have to work with the DEA, or we have to work with our partners in the state police, and we're going to have targeted interventions there. I mean, that's going to be an area where we're going to ask the feds and the state to take more of a leading role uh, while we work to stabilize uh, safety locally uh, so that our residents can walk in the neighborhoods and be free uh, from the overriding fear of violence that we have now. But through that collaborative task force, we absolutely want to uh, address how are all the, not only drugs, how are these guns given to our community? Right? Our communities are flooded with guns. But it was drugs, and then they're used to destroy our neighborhood and community. So you're exactly right. We're going to do some things on the demand side to the opportunity for our young people so that they make different kinds of choices 
but we also have to address the supply side so our community uh, doesn't continue uh, to be the dumping ground uh, for these poisons that are destroying our neighborhoods. Sure. Question for you. Can all throughout the state of New Jersey I think that's good policy to the greatest extent it's permitted under the law. I mean, there are some legal rules uh, that enable officers and others after the violence move to other places. Uh, so I think it's absolutely good policy. I want as many more police officers to live in the city of Newark as legally permitted. But what's, what's also non-negotiable is that you have to know our community. And if you don't know our community, you can't work for our police department. And there's a lot of different ways we can make sure that our officers know our community. Uh, our, our officers have to have a organic, intimate relationship with our community. All of what we talked about is uh, is rooted on the enforcement side in intelligence-based policing. <coughs> We're going to be smart about how we do our policing. We got to know who the bad guys are. We got to know who the good people are. And oftentimes, police uh, undermine their relationship with communities because they just indiscriminately go after a whole bunch of different kinds of people. Right? We're good, but we want to target those people causing most of the crime. And that means we have to have that deep organic relationship with the community. It's absolutely facilitated by people who live in our community. You're not going to have a more intimate relationship with the community uh, 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 when you, uh, compared to when you live in that community. When you're raising your children, as my wife and I do in this community. Uh, you know, so, so this is a personal mission for us. We live here. We have two babies. You know, at 6 o'clock, I'm worried I have to call my wife to make sure she made it home at 6. Uh, in the evening, I put my two babies in the backyard because we don't know what's going to happen uh, in the front row. That means you're going to have an intimate relationship with these issues when you're raising your family. So absolutely, to the great extent possible, we're going to do that. Uh, to the extent the law doesn't allow us after some years to acquire people, we're going to test them on a regular basis. We're going to say, do you know your community? Right? You need to show to us that you understand your community. And ultimately, we know their, if we know if they know their community by their community. Well, how would you Well, you know, part of what we have to do is we have to have much more community events where we get cops out of cars, walking neighborhoods, and developing relationships with neighborhoods and communities. So it's not simply walking, know who the pastors are in that community, know who the community leaders are in that community, who are the block association person, uh, know, you know, Miss Smith down the block, who's like the mayor, you know, of that block, to kind of know the community. Ultimately, I would hold them accountable because you can really ascertain whether or not an officer or a group of officers know their community by their police work. So we see a whole bunch of bad arrests, arresting a lot of low-level offenders indiscriminately, and not really going at those people really driving crime. If we look at sectors in our community and we see high levels of drug activity, high levels of carjacking, high levels of shootings, murders that continue repeatedly, then we know we have, and if we're confident our officers have the tools they need, that's our responsibility. We have to make sure officers have the tools, the equipment, the resources they need. But that data will ultimately evidence whether or not they're doing their job. So that's something that we that, that's something that we're going to use very intensely, very purposefully, so we can hold folks accountable. So, so a big part of what we're saying is results have to drive everything, right? And that that's not only for me. If I'm your mayor, that's for everybody who works under us. Results are going to drive everything. So we see officers and communities that continue to be besieged with this level of violence, and we see we don't have good intelligence coming back uh, into our databases about who's doing what in those communities. Then you don't know your community. You should know the drug dealers in your community if you're an officer in a particular neighborhood. You should know the gang bangers in that community if you're an officer know that neighborhood. If you don't know anybody, you don't know who's, who's up to no good, and you don't know the people who are, who are your friends and who want to help you in that effort, then you're not doing good police work. So that data will help us through that also. What if this start with one crash? Do you know who's I think uh, many. I think first, our uh, plan is, is rooted in practices that, that are proven to be true. Uh, 
our uh, prevention program is really rooted in, pre in bold pretrial format. I've heard anyone speak about that, which is really a fundamental reconceptualization of how folks are dealt with at arrest and making sure that we use effective and proven and empirical risk assessment tools so we can identify the risk posed by an individual and distribute the intervention based upon that risk. So if you're a low level offender, you should get community based uh, pre treatment and programs not incarceration and processing through the criminal justice system. That costs a lot of money, and it also means we have thousands of people, as I said before, who, are on, who can't make bail, locked in prison that destroys their employment prospects, destroys their cohesion with their families to be in, in jail for these low-level sort of offenses. Uh, on the enforcement side, the really smart uh, use of data in a, in a predictive and forecasting way is something very different than what I'm hearing from the, the opponent. But I think the most important difference is I've done this. I, mean, I think the most important uh, difference is I've done this because plans on paper are fundamental and very important because you've got to have a strong vision of what you need to do. And because we have the experience, we have a vision that others don't have that's rooted in what has worked in other places. But after you've spoken and after you put words on paper, you have to now execute. And if you've never done this before, you're not going to get the results if some, as someone who has done it before and has not only done it before, but done it to the tune of three years in a row of reduction of violent crime throughout the state of New Jersey who done it to the tune of doubling the graduation rate for kids in juvenile prison. The, in the juvenile justice system, the average child was 17 on the 5th grade level academically, we doubled the graduation rate. Then it to the tune of reducing recidivism throughout the state of New Jersey, to our Another Chance program by 26%. Then it to the tune uh, of, well, with respect to alternatives to detention. So we did the diversion programs I talked about already, and we did them so effectively that the Annie Casey Foundation found that New Jersey was the best state in the country for alternatives to detention for young people. So you are not going to get a result if we have people learning on the job. You know, if I got on an airplane and the pilot got on the intercom and said, this is my first time flying the plane, but sit tight, everything will be okay. <laughs> Because my safety is that important. The safety of the residents of North is sacred. This is not something where we can talk our way past this problem or give speeches, uh, speak our way through the problem or give rallies, uh, uh, rally our way out of the problem. We've got to have vision, strategy, and then every day, and this is something that Joe Cordell talked about, every day we're on people looking at data, holding folks accountable every day. And that's the only way we're going to see better results. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you.